Hi everyone, welcome to the Enthusiastic Buddhist. In this episode, I want to look at one of the biggest problems we experience when we first start to meditate. That is having too many thoughts and not being able to concentrate on the meditation object. In this episode, I want to have a close look at this common problem and give you some practical tips on how to deal with those thoughts so that they don't become an obstacle to our meditation. Now, the first important thing I want to say is that we shouldn't beat ourselves up for having a busy mind. We need to realize that this is how our minds tend to operate all the time. So this is what makes it even more compelling as to why we need to meditate so that we can give our minds some relief from this constant agitation and the scattered state that it's usually always in. Meditation helps us to slow down this frantic pace of our mind. If you think of our minds like a wheel, you can imagine that with all these thoughts, it's spinning very, very fast. So just like it would take time for the spinning wheel to slow down, it also takes time for our mind to slow down and for those thoughts to start to subside. The thoughts aren't just going to suddenly disappear. So as a beginner meditator, it's not realistic for us to think that we shouldn't have any thoughts when we first start practicing meditation. And it really doesn't help to, start to set ourselves such high ideals, otherwise we're only likely to be disappointed. Instead, we should recognize and accept where we are now which is we've got a mind, a mind I should add that wants to meditate, which is an achievement in itself. And we're now just starting to learn how to train our minds to concentrate on a particular meditation object. No one is ever perfect at meditating when they first start. We all need to give ourselves some time to learn how to meditate, to get used to sitting and doing the actual meditation practice. So don't give up in the early stages. Don't think, oh, well, meditation just isn't for me or I'm not able to meditate because I have so many thoughts. In fact, we need to see that our thoughts are simply natural formations of the mind. Just like it's the eye's habit to see objects, it's the mind's habit to create thoughts. So it's not like it's unnatural to have thoughts, but it's when our thoughts prevent us from concentrating on our meditation object, let's say our breath, that's when our thoughts become something that we need to work with in our meditation. So the bottom line is, is that thoughts are normal and we should expect them. It's just a matter of learning how to relate to them when it comes to meditation. So when we start meditating, what normally happens is that a thought arises. And because the thought is so captivating compared to the simple meditation object, we tend to grasp onto the thought and let it take us along for a ride and sometimes a very long ride. We might be trying to meditate, but suddenly we realize we've been daydreaming instead for the last five minutes. Now, if we recognize that we've been thinking, the first thing we need to do is congratulate ourselves for having noticed our thoughts. I mean, if we sat there supposedly meditating and all we were doing was thinking and daydreaming, you know, the whole time, then we wouldn't really have accomplished anything in terms of meditation there wouldn't be any way for us to re regain our concentration on the meditation object. So the first and crucial step is to become aware of our thoughts and be happy that we've realized that we were thinking and then calmly bring our mind back to the meditation object. Actually, our thoughts become a very important aspect of our meditation. They should act a lot like a, an alarm bell or a reminder for us. It's like they're saying to us, hey, shouldn't you be doing something? And we're like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm, in, I'm supposed to be meditating. So each time we realize that we're thinking, we, we simply let it guide us back to our object of meditation and continue meditating. So therefore, we don't judge or disparage ourselves for having thoughts. Don't think, oh, I'm such a bad meditator. Instead, we should laugh at ourselves, you know, kindly and say, oh, yeah, that was a good thought. It had me going there for a while. And then we calmly come back to the object of meditation. This way, our thoughts actually become useful reminders to help bring our attention back to the meditation object. It's a bit like how a boxer rebounds off the boundary ropes. Our mind should rebound off the thought and back onto the object of meditation. Now, one of the problems we might find though, is that even if we become aware that we're thinking, the thoughts might be so interesting that we have trouble coming back to our meditation object. 
One thing we can do here is to try and depersonalize the thoughts so that they don't feel like they have such a, a grip on us. So when we realize that we're thinking, we should simply just label it as thinking, thinking, thinking. We just ment silently mentally recite this to ourselves, thinking, thinking, thinking. And then we just return back to the meditation object and keep meditating. This way we won't get caught up in the thoughts and the story because we'll recognize the thought as just a thought and nothing more. An alternative to this technique is if you recognize you're thinking about something you want in the future, for instance, you could be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or what you're going to do after dinner, then we should just recognize this and mentally label it as craving, 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 and then come back to the object of meditation. Or if you're feeling angry because of something that happened that day or you're remembering something that made you feel angry, then just recognize it as anger and label it such as aversion, 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 and then just return to meditating. This way we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in the dialogue and add fuel to the thought. Instead, we'll be able to let go of our thoughts so that they don't hook us and we'll be able to continue meditating. In the beginning, they say thoughts come like a waterfall. There just seems to be like this downpour of thoughts that are unceasing. But you'll find that slowly with continuous practice, as the mind starts to settle down, the thoughts also calm down. And you'll start to see that there's actually space between our thoughts. And you'll see that you're not thinking all the time. And as you continuously come back to the object of meditation, your thoughts will naturally start to subside and the spaces between your thoughts will become longer. One way to look at a thought is to see that they're really insubstantial. They might seem real solid and have so much power over us, but really they arose out of nowhere and they'll dissolve into nothing again, as long as we don't try to hold on to them. I've often heard teachers describe thoughts as being like water bubbles. Water bubbles are not solid and they don't last very long. In fact, as our concentration improves, we'll, start, we'll begin to notice that when we have thoughts, that we're not having just one long thought, uh, but that they're actually all small individual thoughts that are just built one on top of the other. So this is why it's so important to become aware of our thoughts, to become mindful of them. When we see them as individual thoughts, then we'll be able to stop them from piling up one on top of the other. So we'll be able to stop the thought before it becomes a sentence, then a chapter, and then a whole thousand page novel. <laughs> Practicing mindfulness here is so empowering. If we can become aware of our thoughts, this means that we'll also have the power to let them go. Now, there might be some thoughts that we might have to act on straight away, like we realise we left the stove on, but in 99% of cases, you can be sure that it's a thought that we can let go of. If we look at the types of thoughts we normally have when we meditate, we'll see that most of the time uh, we're thinking about the future or the past. Now, future thoughts are simply mind created and they rarely ref reflect the reality that actually unfolds. Um, I remember when I was in my meditation retreat, sometimes my mind would play out these very detailed conversations that I thought I would have with certain people once I was out of my retreat. You know, I'd think, okay, I'll start the conversation by saying this and then they'll say that and I'll respond with this and so on and so on. And before I knew it, 10 minutes had gone by. And guess what? I mean, those conversations or scenarios never took place. And if they did, they, ne they were never similar to how I imagined them to be. So what I learned from that was that I was wasting a whole heap of valuable meditation time in total fantasy. And since everything we think about the future is created by the mind and isn't actually present reality, it really is all just fantasy. And so therefore, I mean, is it really worth thinking about? I mean, if it's something important, then think about it after your meditation, but not during it. Another trap we might fall into is thinking about our past when we're trying to meditate. 
Now, when we're thinking about our past, we're talking about memory here. And if any of you have studied memory, you'll know that memory isn't always reliable. You only have to look at eyewitness, studies of eyewitness accounts to see that people always remember things differently. For instance, some might remember that the criminal wore a blue hat and others will swear by it that it was green. I remember driving home after a meditation retreat and I had my teacher and three other Sangha members in the car with me and we're all telling my teacher about this great talk that a nun had given at the retreat. Now, she'd only spoken for 10 minutes, but when each of us told our teacher what she'd said, we all remembered her talk in four entirely different ways. In fact, some points were almost contradictory, and we kind of all just looked at each other, wondering how we could, re how we could have remembered it so differently. It was almost a point of debate because each of us thought our memory was the right one. So how is it that four people can hear the same talk but remember it differently? The reason is, is because we take the objective reality but we turn it into subjective memory. So the, as the facts come in, we overlay them with our own understanding of the world, our own prejudices, our own mental and emotional filters. So what we end up remembering is never really the truth. In another example, when we think of our past relationships, we often think of them in a negative way because when we end romantic relationships, we often exaggerate the bad bits so that we can kind of feel justified for having left that relationship and moved on. But if we were to read through an old journal or diary of that time, we'd probably find so many good memories in there of the relationship that we'd just forgotten about. I mean, surely there must have been some good things and good times that kept us there in the first place. So what I'm trying to say is that what we think happened in the past isn't always true. So how much can we really trust our memory? So in terms of meditation practice, should we really be allowing ourselves to dwell on thoughts about our past? Is it really something we should be giving priority to? The great meditation teacher Arjun Chah advised his students to repeat not sure, not sure, whenever a thought arose in their mind. And that went for all thoughts, past, present and future. So since our thoughts about the past and the future can be so unreliable, we should employ this technique of just mentally reciting the words not sure, not sure, whenever we have thoughts about the past or the future. I'm, you know, I'm not sure that's what will happen in the future. I'm not sure that's entirely what happened in the past, that that was the whole story. Recognising this uncertainty and having a mind that lets go will prevent us from getting carried away by our thoughts. Actually, on a side note, repeating not sure, not sure is a wonderful technique to use, especially if we're worrying about something in the future. Fear is such a powerful emotion and it's fueled by our fearful thoughts. So the minute we can diffuse a thought saying to ourselves, not sure, not sure, then it will remind us that the future is uncertain and we'll be able to relax and find more peace. Now, if we're creative people or we have a vivid imagination, we might find this technique helpful for dealing with our thoughts. One of the things we can do is imagine the thought being placed onto leaves on a river and then imagine that they're floating away down the river. That way we can imagine that they're disappearing into the distance and as they say, out of sight, out of mind. This type of creative visualisation technique is really helpful for some thoughts but in most cases it's best to just use the labelling techniques such as repeating, thinking, thinking or not sure, not sure. Otherwise, we, we could possibly get caught up in the visualisation of the river and the leaves. When I was in my meditation retreat, I had my own version of this visualisation. I remember there was something that was really bothering me and I, I couldn't let it go easily. It was, it was just this really strong emotion that I, I couldn't let go with any of the usual meditation techniques. So I decided uh, to be a bit more creative and I imagined that I was actually like tying these particular thoughts to heavy weights and dropping them off in the middle of the ocean. And then for each disturbing thought, I imagined that I was placing a buoy, like one of those flotation devices, <laughs> on, on the water. And I would say to, my, to, say to that thought, 
okay, I'm letting you go now and if you're really important, then I'll come back to you in the future. You know, I can find you again because of this flotation marker. And that visualization worked well for me because um, I was able to resume my meditation and obviously I never felt the need to revisit that disturbing thoughts again because I, I can't even remember what they were now. So maybe for less distressing thoughts we could imagine the, the thought of a leaf flowing down the river but for more, dis more disturbing and persistent thoughts maybe you could try the ocean visualization. But perhaps this is a good time to mention though that Meditation creates space in our lives and in our mind which can allow past troubles in our life to resurface. For instance, if we experience an abusive childhood or anything else traumatic, this might resurface during our meditation. And if this is the case, it's recommended by leading meditators such as Jack Cornfield that people look at supporting their meditation practice with counselling and therapy as well. It said that combining these two can help heal our hearts and minds faster so that we can come to our, so we, that we can come to terms with our past and can also make progress in our meditation as well. So we shouldn't rely on meditation as a sole cure for trauma that we might have experienced in the past. We may need to look at professional counseling services as well. Now, on a lighter note, when we start to become aware of our thoughts, something strange will happen. Our thoughts will automatically stop coming. You see, when we become really mindful and can see the thoughts starting to take formation, the thoughts will become much shyer, as, as if they're saying, uh-oh, you know, she's looking at us again, where do we go, what do we do? <laughs> it's only when we don't have mindfulness that they can come as uninvited guests and then open the doors and let, let all the other thoughts come in and create crush the party. So we can stop all that by developing our mindfulness and our awareness to the point where we can detect the thoughts as they begin to arise. But this takes practice and it takes time. But if we practice every day, we will get to the stage. It's not a, then a question of if, but when. So in the beginning, our task is to celebrate the fact that we have enough awareness to see our thoughts. Then when we realize we've been thinking, we just acknowledge this and we don't judge it and we can mentally recite, recite to ourselves either thinking, thinking, craving, craving, aversion, aversion, or not sure, not sure. And then we can watch that thought naturally fall away. Then we simply return our awareness to the meditation object and continue meditating. In fact, it's good to try and also increase our concentration and focus on the object even more every time we come back to it. Now, one thing that is sometimes helpful is to remind ourselves during our meditation of why we're meditating in the first place. What is our reason for meditating? Is it so we, become, we can become more peaceful and have less problems with others? Whatever the reason is, it can often help to remember our motivation during our practice so that we don't get discouraged by our thoughts or other problems during our meditation. Instead, we should constantly remotivate ourselves and inspire ourselves, you know, be our own coach and encourage ourselves to put more effort in, into our concentration. Now remember, if a thought is really persistent, then we should remind ourselves that we have plenty of time to think about it after our meditation. And if we find that we're getting distracted during meditation um, a lot, like it's really a common problem for us, then we might want to look at making some other adjustments before our meditation session. There's a few practical uh, steps that we can do prior to our session to try and reduce the busyness of our mind. One of them is to try wearing warmer clothes. Feeling warm can actually make us feel a bit more relaxed, which can also help to calm the mind down a bit. So try putting on a jumper or wrapping a shawl around you or just covering your legs with a blanket. The other trick is to eat something before your session. So don't try to meditate on an empty stomach and try to eat heavier meals. So that includes like some comfort foods such as bread or potatoes because when our bodies feel a bit more weighed down, it can have a calming effect on our mind. 
And also avoid stimulating foods such as coffee, tea and chocolate. But remember to only employ these techniques when you find you're continuously having a problem of a very distracted mind. Like I said before, having thoughts during meditation is a natural and common thing and it's about trying to train our mind to notice these thoughts, let them go and then come back to the object of meditation. These other techniques are simply options for us to try if, for example, we've been trying to meditate for 10 minutes but we can't even bring our mind um, to concentrate on the meditation object at all. Now, if we're an experienced meditator or we've been meditating for a while and the other methods I mentioned aren't working effectively enough for you, there's this one technique that you might want to try. This is usually a technique taught to people who've been meditating for a few months at least, but I thought some people here might benefit from it. Now, if our mind seems quite agitated and we're having a continuous downpour of thoughts, we might want to tire it out a bit and try and exhaust our mind a little. One technique is to think of something like the alphabet and mentally recite it to ourselves from the beginning, like A, B, C, D, you know, we can all the way up to J, for instance. And then we try to reverse the order in our mind, thinking J, I, H, G, <laughs> until we get back to A. We try to um, make it challenging, uh, choose something that is, you know, takes quite a bit of concentration. We could also think of a verse from a nursery rhyme, for instance, like Incy Wincy Spider climbed up the water spout. And then we try to uh, remember it in reverse. So spout, water, the... <laughs> yeah, doing this requires concentration, but we shouldn't spend too long on this, just long enough to tire our mind a little bit, and then we return to concentrating on our original object of meditation. In fact, if we do this technique correctly, we should notice our concentration has increased quite a lot when we come back to our object of meditation because of the increased concentration we needed for that mental exercise. Actually, sometimes doing this exercise just once can lead you into a lovely meditation that is clear, balanced and stable. I've given you a lot of information in this video, but I hope it's helped you to create a new perspective on your thoughts and distracted mind, because we shouldn't see our thoughts as something negative, but something that we all have to work with. They're like the fuel for our fire. They will help us in our meditation, because by continuously bringing the mind back each time we're distracted, we'll be moving one step closer to the peace, bliss and wisdom that meditation will eventually bring us to. So don't give up in the early stages, keep trying, it will get easier. So I hope you found this video informative and helpful. Please like and share if you did and feel free to subscribe to my channel for future videos. And if you want more information on meditation and Buddhism, you can check out my website enthusiasticbuddhist.com. So that's all from me. Take care, have a great week, and I hope to see you in the next video.